The Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return, sponsored by Narconon Ojai. Hello. Welcome to the Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. My name is Joni Siegel. I'm the host for this podcast. My husband, Steve Siegel, is the producer for the podcast. If you would like to reach out to us with a story, you can reach us at the Addiction Podcast at yahoo.com. Or we have a Facebook group by the name The Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. We also have a re- website, theaddictionpodcast.com. So feel free to reach out to us and tell us your story and we'll go from there. Today is episode number 169 and today we have an interview with a gentleman named Steve Mason. Steve Mason is a Long Island, New York based actor, stunt performer, author and speaker who has been in and involved in many popular and award-winning shows such as Gotham, Blue Bud, Blue Bloods, Power, Feed the Beast, The Blacklist, Law and Order, SVU, Daredevil, Orange is the New Black, Happy, and The Affair, among others. After losing his father to suicide and finding the body when he was just eight years old, Steve, as you would imagine, had some serious challenges when it came to his early development years. As time went on, he chose some of the coping mechanisms that mirrored what he briefly witnessed his father use, alcohol and drugs. By the time Steve reached his early teenage years, he was smoking cigarettes and marijuana daily. Thought to be just a phase, the signs of true addiction were ignored by friends, family, and social workers and therapists alike. Before age 20, Steve would be introduced to cocaine, which would eventually lead him down a very dark road of depression, suicidal thoughts, behavior, and heavy drug use as his daily way of life. Steve wrote and co-produced Eight, a 21-minute short film based on actual events of his father's, a former Long Island police officer's, death. It has grown into a platform to discuss the subject matter that has long been considered taboo. Eight opens the door to discuss the ripping effects of suicide, substance abuse, and what we could be looking for to help someone in need. The time to help, heal, and educate is now. This is his message. Let's not lose one more life. And here at the Addiction Podcast, we concur. Let's talk to Steve Mason. Steve Mason, thanks for being on the podcast today. Thank you for having me. So what I like to do is start with your story. How did you first get introduced to drugs and or alcohol? What led you down that path? So uh, my story is a unique one, but uh, not like unlike many others. You know, everybody's got their own story. Uh, for me, I, my father was a police officer in New York and he was an alcoholic and he ended up committing suicide when I was eight years old. And as life would deal me the cards, I found the body. So at eight years old, I was sort of introduced to life and death and head of household and, and amongst many other things all at once. So it wasn't, wasn't very easy. And. From that point, somebody in the neighborhood was like, hey, why don't you try this? It'll probably make you feel better. And uh, that's the thing with drugs and alcohol. People use them because they work until they don't. Steve, you're bouncing a little bit. Oh, am I? I'm sorry. That's okay. Uh, It could just be the computer, but if... I might have maybe hit the table. I'll try to be very... I won't move a muscle. Okay. No, you can move. (laughs) Just watch watch the bouncing. You know, that's a pretty heavy duty thing for an eight year old. I have a a granddaughter who just turned seven and the thought of her having to see something like that is just it's it's horrific. I'm sorry you had to see that. That's uh, yeah. Well, again, we, you know, we all, I don't mean to cut you off, but we all have our own journey and our own cross to bear. And, you know, uh, as maybe subjectively uncommon my story may be, it's not any better or any worse than any story that I hear when I'm out speaking to people and everyone has their own story. So I I don't think that my story is any better or any worse than any of the stories that that the children I speak to will eventually tell or the adults that already have their story to tell. So I just uh, accept the fact that this is, um, these are the cards I was dealt. And for many, many, many years, I allowed that to be a cop out to do the wrong thing and make the wrong choices and not treat people correctly and not treat myself correctly. And 
not have the self-respect and all the things that come along with once you start to have the introspect and do the work many, many years later. But, you know, I made the wrong decisions for a long time and used that story as an excuse. And it was only, um, I've been drug free now for about nine, almost 10 years and alcohol a little bit less than that. But when I found that I could turn my story into a platform for positive change, it really changed my life. You know, I can, it's very emotional. I can come to tears at any time talking about the story and talking about the passion that I have and, and the people that I deal with on a daily basis that, you know, I speak at schools and law enforcement agencies and all these different places that pay me very well to, to speak at their facilities. But then I have a host of other people that I speak to and do it for, you know, no charge at all, because it's what I really feel I I'm here to do is to help people understand it. I, I tell people countless times a day that, you know, I don't tell you that living a clean and sober life is better because misery loves company or because I'm your spouse that's disappointed with you or I'm a parole officer or I'm a judgmental neighbor. I, I tell you because that's the truth that it's not always easy, but it is worth it. And I feel that that's really why, you know, part of why I, I uh, agreed to come on this podcast is to just further get that message out that, you know, it's okay to not be perfect. And we're all going to F up and we're all going to make mistakes and we're encouraged to make mistakes, but we're also encouraged to learn from them and not to continue to make the same mistakes over and over. Right. So you're eight years old and you see your dad commit suicide and you were the oldest. I was the youngest. You were the youngest. Okay. Yeah. And so who was it that introduced you then to drugs or alcohol? It was a, a neighborhood teenager uh, who had given me a pill and I couldn't even tell you what that pill was. I was, it was right after the funeral. So I was probably, eight, you know, just eight years old. Um, that didn't stick, but it wasn't long before I was smoking pot daily. Um, you know, and, and I, again, the story I tell is that there's a natural progression that happens when you start to take any type of drug. And that is that the amount that you take to feel good today is not going to be the same amount you need to take tomorrow to feel the same level of good. You have to increase it, increase it. And then when one drug doesn't work, you have to then increase it to a stronger and more powerful drug. It's just, you know, it's a, it's a natural progression, like I said. So, you know, smoking pot lasted until my mid teens. And then it was, uh, hallucinogens and then it was cocaine by the time I was 19 and then it was that was pretty much hook line and sinker for me I was I would graduate to opiates not shooting heroin but I was shooting uh, Dilaudid and another very powerful painkiller um, sort of like morphine even stronger and you know fast forward through the years when I, when I got clean, not, like I said, almost 10 years ago, my daily equivalent dose was over 140 Vicodin pills a day. Wow. And to the average layman, they couldn't even understand or comprehend that amount of drugs being taken by one person on a daily basis. You know, that was me every day. And, you know, people say, um, it, it doesn't matter whether they believe it or not. I, I know what I was doing. I know what I was on. I was doctor shopping, all the things that could be done back in that day where they've tried to curtail that a little bit. And they, you know, uh, it's obviously we know what's going on in the country with them trying to stop the opiate prescriptions. And then they just, you know, that just really snowballed the heroin usage again and the methamphetamine shooting. So it's, it's a, it's a disaster really. And anybody that's in the throes of it will agree, you know, they don't know necessarily know how to get out of it. They just know that it's a living hell being in it. Right. So when you, did you go to college? I took college classes, but I didn't graduate from college. I didn't graduate from high school either. Okay. What did you, I know you were doing drugs, obviously, but what was your goal? Where did you want to go with your life at the time? At what time? When you were in high school or taking college courses, okay, what did so you want to do? I was... I don't think that I necessarily knew on a conscious level what I wanted to do when I was a teenager or, or into high school, but I did have a passion for music. And so I was classically trained as an operatic bass vocalist. Oh, wow. 
Yeah, so that was an interesting thing, and I was among the lowest of the bases called Basso Profundo, which is the lowest operatic uh, base. And I thought that's where I was going. And um, as life would would hand me a different set of cards, I ended up coming down with a condition where both of my lungs collapsed, and I was in the hospital. And in an effort to save my life, they had to intubate me, which was putting a you know a tube down my throat and putting me into a medically induced coma. And when they did that, they cut one of my vocal cords or vocal folds. So the singing was instantly uh, ended right then and there. Wow. I was in a did coma in the hospital for a month. And uh, I was very depressed and suicidal after that myself because I, I couldn't even talk, never, never, you know, uh, never mind sing. I can imagine. Did the lungs collapsing, was that because of the drugs? Well, they didn't know. They didn't know that. They just, they, they called it a very bad asthma episode. They thought I had asthma my whole life. And interestingly enough, this was only about a, not even a year ago, I was in the hospital for a unrelated thing. And they had to do a, a what was it, an endoscopy, an upper endoscopy. And they, they saw the, they were looking at the larynx. And when they did the endoscopy, I believe that that's what it was. Uh, I'm sorry, it was a CAT scan. It was a CAT scan of the esophagus. And when they do that procedure, they can actually see the lungs. So interestingly enough, my girlfriend and I were in the hospital and, and we were waiting for the, the test results on the CAT scan. And where I live, just outside the city, there's a, a teaching uh, medical facility where you know all of the resident doctors are under uh, the, the guru, right? So... The doctor, along with, uh, I don't know, maybe 10 or 15 other physicians or students come into my room and they're going over the test results. And then the doctor says, um, okay, I'm going to ask all the students to leave. And I looked at my girlfriend and I said, okay. He says, I have to ask you a question and it's going to be off the record. And I said, okay. He said, I want to ask you, did you do a lot of cocaine in your, in your life? And I have no no problem telling my story to anybody. I said, yeah, I was very highly addicted to it. He said, yeah, I can tell. And I said, how can you tell? And he showed me the, the cat scan of the lungs. And he, there was this darkened area. And he said, this is known as paracetyl emphysema. And it's a thinning of the wall, uh, the thinning of the lining of the walls of the lungs. And it's due to excessive cocaine use. And so I said, well, I was in the hospital and uh, I had this asthma episode and I had asthma my whole life. And he said, no, stop right there. You never had asthma. He said, you had allergies. You, you had an asthmatic episode caused by the cocaine and the smoking. That's what made your lungs collapse. And you're lucky to be alive and blah, 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 blah. And now I show part of my presentation when I speak to the schools I show them the actual CAT scan of my lungs to show them as, you know, um, part of this story that I'm telling you. And it's kind of interesting, but very true and very real. And, you know, I, I tell people that the, the, the fact of the matter is that this, this uh, condition, like I said, is known as paraceptal emphysema. And it's lying dormant in my body right now, which means that if I don't pick up cocaine or I don't smoke another cigarette, it probably won't do any further damage, probably. However, he was very clear in saying that even one line of cocaine or one cigarette could be enough to instantly crumble the walls of the lungs, and obviously death would be imminent. Well, that would keep me clear of drugs. You know, that sounds like somebody who's never done drugs. It is. Yeah, because you know what? Nobody wakes up and says, I want to be a heroin addict. Nobody. Right. Nobody right. wakes up and says, I want to be a child molester. Nobody wakes up and says, I want to be a bad parent, a jealous lover, a rotten sibling. Nobody ever says these things. We do the best we can with the information that we have available to us. It's only that when we're open to an influx of new information as a reference point that we're able to see whether or not we're truly making our, our best decisions. And so for somebody to say, you know, that would, that would keep me from going near drugs. Look at the people that have those, um, they have the tracheotomies in their neck and then they smoke the cigarettes through the hole in their neck because they're so addicted to the nicotine. But from logic, you look at it and you go, I would, how could you, oh my God, I would never. No, you would never until you did. Yep. 
Point taken. I, right. I point taken. I, I stand corrected. What what got you to get clean and sober? What one of the thing the reason why we call this podcast the point of no return is because we want the people we're talking to to focus on what was the moment when you said I have to either stop doing drugs or I'm going to die or I'm going to go to jail or or so what have you. I was um, I was up for almost two weeks straight and I couldn't get high and I couldn't die. And I said, something's got to change. And so uh, I'm very, I'm proud of my story and I'm proud of how I did it. And I've had very, I've had many, um, I don't want to call them arguments, but heated discussions with, with high powered psychologists. And I have conceded to say that there is no right or wrong way to get clean. The only thing that matters is getting clean. That's right. And I've had therapists tell me that I should be very careful and not tell my story to other people. And I say, why? And they say, well, because not many people can do it the way I did it, which was, and I'll tell you the story of how I got clean. And after that point of two weeks of, of not being able to get high anywhere, I was just consuming drugs and just staying awake. And I said, something's got to change. And so I, I came clean to my mom the next day. And the funny part about that is, you know, you say you came clean to someone and you know, people know what's going on. They just want to sweep it under the rug and they don't want to really, you know, discuss the elephant in the room for whatever reason. It's not always easy. So I, I came clean and said, you know, look, I, I've, you know, been taking a lot of drugs and nobody in my family, my father was an alcoholic, but he had been dead for, you know, 25 years at this point already. And nobody in my family had ever had any experience with this you know i have a very small family just and just to backtrack a little bit the story the plot thickens a little bit because when my father died his mother was so sickened by his death that she ended up in the hospital she died about four and a half months later and her husband then died two weeks later or, or less than a month later after her from a broken heart oh my god so i actually lost one half of my family in less than six months so, eight years old. Right. You know, and whether you're eight, 18, 28, or 80, it's it's nothing for anybody to have to go through. But these are the things, you know, this is this is real life. Yep. Um so as I was saying, um that part of the family had, had you know been basically wiped out very quickly. And so my family's very small, so we didn't have any experience with, with drug abuse or, or rehabs or anything like that. So the first thing my mother said was, we have to get you to a hospital. We have to get you to a hospital. I said, mom, the hospital is not going to do anything for me. It's not for me. She begged, she begged, she begged. So I probably just to appease her, I said, okay, let's go to the hospital. And part of my thing is that I've always been um, a very uh, high functioning addict. I was always pretty, you know, intellectually, um, uh, I, I was above average in a lot of things and I kind of knew what I was doing and I did my research and most addicts do. Most addicts know what they're doing. And Were you working at the time, Steve? Yeah, I was, I was running several businesses. I was making six figures a year. Uh, it all, it all collapsed very quickly. Right. Uh, so it, there's no silver lining there, but, and I'll get to that point if you want me to, but at this point I said, okay, I'll go to the hospital. And the doctor said, all right, Steve, what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to admit you into the hospital. We're going to administer some medicine to help you use the withdrawals. And then we'll, we'll keep you in here for observation. And I, and I stopped in mid sentence. I said, I'm, I'm sorry, what did you just say? He said, what? I said, well, correct me if I'm wrong. Did you just tell me that you're going to give me drugs to get me off of drugs? <laughs> he said, well, 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 it's not like that. I said, no, it's exactly like that. And he said, well, you know, you can't just stop. You can't just stop cold turkey. You know, you could die. And I said, that's bullshit. You know that as well as I do. I said, I'm not hooked on benzos. There's no risk of, with, with benzos like Xanax or Ativan, value, you, if you take it too much and you're addicted, you, could, you had run the risk of seizures and or death. But when it comes to opiates or cocaine, it's just like death. You want to die, but you're not going to. Right. So I said, you know, maybe comfortable isn't what I need right now. And with that, I left the hospital. 
And so my mom argued with me and she said, you know, we got to get you to a rehab. And I said, mom, I am too strong for rehab. I'm not, I got myself into this mess. I need to get myself out of it. She said, please, please, please. She begged, she cried. Eventually I gave in. I said, all right, let's go to rehab. She takes me to a rehab place and I'm sitting in the, um, in the waiting room and uh, somebody introduced himself to me, a very, very um, obese woman. And I don't remember her name, but let's just call her Ann for all you know, argument's sake. And, and the nurse took me in and she was doing my vitals and the intake information. And I said, uh, so let me ask you something. The, the person in the waiting room, uh, Ann, who is she? She said, oh, she's the director of this, this rehab and she's going to be uh, instrumental in, in your rehabilitation. And you know, again, I tell this story all the time and I don't mean it with any disrespect to anybody, but I was very honest with her. And I said, do me a favor. I said, tell me how somebody who can't put the Hagen dazs down is going to tell me how to put the drugs down. And she was appalled. But with that, I left. And my mom cried the whole way home. I said, mom, you got to just drive me home. And, you know, as clear as it was, uh, you know, as if it happened yesterday, I remember clearly as, as her taillights drove off in the distance up my block. I looked and I said to myself, look, either go inside and get clean or go call your dealer. It's your choice. And that was really the biggest aha moment for me was to realize that it's all a choice. Everything is a choice and it's still a choice today. 10 years down the road, I still have tears. I still deal with depression. I still deal with anxiety. I'm still a fucking lunatic. It's who I am, you know, but I'm real. And I've been through a lot. And the one thing that I helped many addicts get clean is because I say, you know what? You don't have to know what the right answer is because you can get overwhelmed thinking, well, what am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to do it? You just have to know what the wrong thing is and not go backwards. You know, Einstein was the one that said it, you know, the definition of insanity is to do the same thing over and over and expect a different result. Right. I try to, um, I try to use different analogies with people that I think will resonate with them. And depending upon who my audience is, I use different analogies. And, and sometimes I come up with some really clever ones. And the, the one I've been using lately is to understand that the merry-go-round never makes a left or a right. It only goes around in the same circle over and over and over and over and over and over and over, and over again. It doesn't make any turns. So if you think subconsciously, well, that's the thing we don't think. It is a subconscious thought that, oh, maybe it's going to be different this time. It's not going to be different this time. We get so used to pressing record, right, on our little tape players. That's another one I use is that we press record over and over. Because it's the same shit every time. You get high for a very little period of time, then you come down. Then you shame yourself, you hate yourself. And the only way to get rid of the shame is to get high again. Right. So we have to learn how to press play instead of pressing record. And that was part of my, part of my healing was I was able to press play. I was able to say, you know what, this sucks, but that sucks more. And I know what's gonna happen and you know the I, I I have like a graph that I show with uh, with the students, and I say that depending upon the drug that you use, the level of of dopamine that the the brain releases is increased, right? So for pot, you smoke pot, you're gonna get a little giggly, and then when you come down, you're gonna come a little bit below your baseline, and you're gonna be lethargic, or you're gonna eat Doritos, or you know you're gonna make some bad choices, but it's not gonna be the end of the world. But then with the cocaine, you know, the high is so much higher, but the low becomes so much lower behind the baseline. Now, now opiates and heroin, the high is heaven, but the down is the depths of hell. Right. And see the body, the brain just wants to be at a homeostasis, just wants to be balanced. Doesn't want to be too high. It doesn't want to be too low. It wants to be even. So, you know, the worst you'll do for, for pot is you might lie to your mom about a, a school book that you're going to buy. And like, mom, I need 20 bucks. I'm going to the movies or I need to buy something. And you're going to take the $20 and buy a bag of weed. And, you know, it's a, a little a little lie. But 
For cocaine, you're going to steal the $20 or the $200. And well, with heroin, we see how many people sell their bodies and eventually sell their souls. So the higher the high, the lower the low, and the body doesn't want to go through that. So we have to, you know, we have to understand that again, people are making these decisions the best that they can. Yep. You know, I think it's absolutely amazing. And I hope that the listeners get the point you made that when you went to the hospital, what they wanted to do was to substitute one drug for another, which is so often the standard protocol for drug addiction. And it is not logical. It does not make sense to substitute it's one retarded. drug for another. It's <laughs> I'm what, sorry, for a lack of better terms, it's stupid. Yes, it it's is. It's stupid. I, t I just, this is a true story. A friend of, I I'll call him a friend. He's a friend. He's having a, a bit of a hard time getting clean with heroin and Xanax. And he's on his way to another stint in rehab. And I said, listen, he, you know, he's mandated, his parole is making him go. And I said, if you go there and you allow them to give you Ativan or any of these drugs to alleviate the symptoms, you're not coming out clean. And if you make the decision that I'm gonna party one last time before I go into rehab, you're going there because you're being mandated and not because you wanna go. And you're not gonna change unless you wanna change. You are listening to the Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. For more information on the podcast or to reach out if you have a story you would like to share with us, go to our Facebook page by the same name, or you can email us at theaddictionpodcast at yahoo.com, or go to our website, theaddictionpodcast.com, or call us at 727-314-7080. And please remember to subscribe to our podcast wherever you listen to podcasts and give us a five-star review. For more information on our sponsor, Narconon Ojai, visit their website at narcononojai.org. That's N-A-R-C-O-N-O-N-O-J-A-I.org. Or call 1-866-231-5924. That's 1-866-231-5924. Sometimes, the hardest thing about getting someone into recovery is getting them to agree to treatment. Bobby Newman, a certified drug counselor with 30 years experience and an over 85% success rate as an interventionist, has created a series of 12 videos that you can use right now to learn every step to get your loved one to agree to treatment. Call 1-833-918-0008 today and say the word podcast to get a 10% discount. Or go to newmaninterventions.com and type in the word podcast for a 10% discount. This service comes with a free one hour consultation with Bobby. That's right. Bottom line. That's right. Bottom line. And part of, uh, again, the, you know, part of my story, my best friend who I grew up next to, uh, when we were growing up, you know, from the time I was three months old when we moved into that house and he was six months older. So, but from infancy until we were 35, we were the best of friends. And we got, we, we really didn't, after high school, we kind of separated and went our own ways, but we were both getting high. And we sort of came back into each other's lives and found out about each other's demons and and he went to uh, a hospital where he was there for about seven or 10 days and came out. And the bottom line is that a month after we got clean, he relapsed and died. Oh. And the, the strange thing is, is that I miss the kid every day. That is so tragic, Steve. I just... It's why we do this podcast. I just hope, hope people listen and they, they, ugh. I interviewed a mother two weeks ago who lost her son to an overdose. And I just, it breaks my heart. It is heartbreaking. It is heartbreaking. And, you know, the day before he died, I spoke to him and 
he was telling me he's having, you know, he was such a gifted person. He had two master's degrees in music and one in composition, one in performance. And he was uh, published in, in Europe. And, and he was just an amazing musician, an amazing classical pianist. And he said, Steve, I'm so jealous of you. And I said, you're jealous of me. What are you talking about? I wish I, I you have such a, a God-given gift. How, how could you be jealous of me? And he said, because I'm having such a hard time keeping clean. And, and I said, look, I have plans tonight, but do you want me to break them? Because I'll come over, we'll watch a movie or hang out like the old times or, or just, I mean, I'll get your mom to take you back to the hospital. Do you need something? He said, no, I'm going to be all right. He said, I'm just, you know what, man, I really wish that I had like a drink just to help me like ease my nerves. He's like, would you do me a favor? Would you, would you bring over a bottle of vodka? And I've been there so many times where, you know, you just want to hit the reset button and you just want to start the next day over. And I went and bought the bottle and I brought it over to him and I was able to hug him and tell him I loved him before I left. And then the next day I called him and there was no answer. And I just had a bad feeling in my stomach. I called all day. And finally about five o'clock that night, his father answered the phone. He said, Steve, he's dead. <sighs> God, he's fucking kidding me. So the toxicology report came back about whatever it was, you know, a few months later. And Turned out that he had six or seven ounces of vodka and 180 milligram oxycontin in his system. And he passed out on his back and he threw up and, and died Choked. from choking on it. And so, you know, I didn't make the phone call to get the drugs for him and I didn't pour the vodka down his throat. But people would say, Steve, like, how can you live with yourself? that you gave him that bottle. And it's very, this is one of the biggest takeaways that addicts and, and all people can really benefit from is what I said earlier is that people are always doing the best that they can with the information that they have access to at any given point, right? So we have to learn as part of our, our healing and I don't like to call it recovery. I just call it healing. Right? Like I, I saw something on your website about, I'm sorry, I get right back to this, but it's just something on your website about how you, you guys don't promote, um, you know, addicts for life. Instead, it's, you know, um, uh, you know, healing. And I, I think of it the same way. Like if you consider yourself, I, I'm an addict, I'm an addict, I'm an addict. Well, then you're owning that you're an addict then. Exactly. You know, like I had the flu once, but I don't have the flu anymore. I healed from it. That's right. So, I had substance abuse issues and, and I have an addictive personality. I like to do things and, and become, they become very habitual to me. Now I choose the gym. Well, not during the pandemic. Now I'm doing home workouts, but you know, I choose different things to, to be um, habitual with or, or have addiction to, <clears throat> excuse me. So what we have to do, the first step in getting clean, right. Is to forgive ourselves. Because once we forgive ourselves, we could say, no matter, it doesn't matter what you did. You know, there are people that will have to live with the rest of their lives that, that they killed somebody for the drug, or they stole out of their mother's wallet, or they had sex with somebody to get high. Like these are real things. And there's such shame involved. And they don't know how to, how to, how to heal from that. It's really simple. You just have to say, I forgive myself. And that's the first step in doing that. And then it's sort of like the way the mechanics work. It's really logical. Once you are able to forgive yourself, you're then able to look outside and you go, holy shit, my mom, she was doing the best that she could. And my brother and the neighbor and my uncle. So wait a second. Everybody's in the same boat here? Yeah. Yeah, you're not doing it on your own. That's right. We're all doing it together. We're all one. 
And the faster we realize that, the easier it is. Right. So I forgive myself for those things that I've done. Now, saying it is one thing, but will you, the, 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 the reality is that once you say it, okay, based on experience, based on statistics, you may make that same mistake two out of the next 10 times but you're not making it eight out of the next 10 times. And so that gives you a reference point. You go, wow, you know what? I don't want to steal from my mom. No, I don't want to give you uh, sex or, or, or something for, ew. No, I don't want to do that. I want to respect myself. And again, once I can forgive myself, I can forgive others. Once I respect myself, I can respect others. Once I love myself, I can love others. That's huge. That's huge. I mean, it all starts with you. And I think that so often when we talk to people who are former addicts, it's, you know, I didn't have any self-respect or I didn't have any self-confidence. Do you know, it starts there. Of course it does. And it's really, it's so, it's mind boggling how simple it is that the choice becomes just as easy to make it to get high or to stay clean. Here I am 10 years later and I have to know who I am. Like there was a, there was a point in the beginning where I wanted to lie to myself and say, you know what? I could probably be that guy who could do one line of cocaine on new year's Eve with the people that can do that. No, that's not me. I couldn't do one drink. I had to have three drinks and then it wasn't a good outcome anytime. Right. You know, for some people they can have a, a glass of wine. They can have a beer at a ball game. For me, it's poison. Once it enters my bloodstream, it's poison. It's no good for me. There's never been a good outcome from it. You know, I might have thought I had fun, but I'm lucky to be alive with a lot of fun. And and what was that? The expense of other people's either feelings or or whatever it may have been. It wasn't good for me. Right. And again, I still, and I, I, again, I, I have these two brothers who I love dearly and they're not blood brothers. They're, they are brothers and they're both friends of mine and they both struggle. And there's a whole big history in their family. A lot of, um, several people have died from heroin overdoses. They're not too far behind. God willing, they, they listen and, and do whatever it is to get clean. But I tell them all the time, like I, I see them a lot during the summer. Um, I work like a survival job when I'm not on TV or doing what I love to do. I, I work in a construction field with, for a friend's company and I see them a lot during the summer, but in the winter, I don't see them, but I'm always, uh, I'm sure to text them all the time. And I say, Hey, listen, this guy that you know, and you think is uh, perfect because I'm, I'm, because I'm clean and I eat kale. They make fun of me because I eat shrubbery and kale and all these things. <laughs> and I said, try it. You might like it, but I say, you know what, Mr. Perfect's not perfect today. I'm crying, I'm on the couch, I can't get up, I'm depressed. But you know what, it's still worth it. It's still worth it. Not easy, but always worth it. And that, right. that's just the bottom line. And I, that's the message I wanna get out to people because there are so many stresses that we inadvertently put on our own shoulders that we don't know that we're doing when we're addicted to something. And we're giving ourselves more work, we're making life harder than it has to be, and we don't know it. It's only when we get clean that those stresses come off of our shoulders and we go, you mean I was doing that for that long and I didn't have to? <laughs> no, no, you didn't have to. <laughs> you know, so. Steve, you did a film, didn't you? I did. Tell me about the film. Okay, so uh, a few years ago I was, you know, I've been, my, my resume is, is pretty, um, they're pretty full resume. I've been on a lot of television shows and doing either stunt work or acting, but I wasn't getting the larger role that, that suited me. I was very frustrated. So I was on my way home from an audition in, in Manhattan and I said, you know, I'm going to be like Sylvester Stallone and write my own story. You know, he wrote Rocky. That was his big thing. And it dawned on me. I said, what story can I tell better than my own? And so that's where eight, the idea of eight, became a, a concept and uh, very quickly I realized that it would be a lot of money to film a full feature so I raised enough money to do a, a short film that cost me about 25 grand to do uh, it's a 21 minute film 
and it's based on the last month or so of my father's life. And it was sort of a very cathartic experience because I played my father in the film. Right. And, uh, and I had a very talented young actor who played me at eight years old. And it tells the last month or so the story of, of my dad's life. Wow. Is it available to watch anywhere? You know, it is. And I'll, I'll give, uh, it's my website. It, it, I know that they, I don't really run it. So I know that they have it on there and they don't know what, what uh, I know it could be bought and all those things. And I, I screen it at all the schools. So for any of your listeners that contact me, I'd be more than happy to, to share it with them in some, in some capacity. Um, uh, either through, you know, either a partial YouTube or Vimeo or one of these links, but um, it's, it's a great movie. And I'm not saying that just because I did it. Um, but I have children that are, that are nine, 10, 11 years old crying in my arms in schools. And I have those same schools, principals and teachers and faculty crying in my arms as well. And, you know, it starts the dialogue to yep. say, this is how it starts. This is how, how we start to heal. And, you know, yeah, I've been down a, a pretty dark road and so have a lot of other people. Right. So I don't, I don't pat myself on the back for getting clean, but I say, you know what, once you get clean, then you just want to start helping other people. And that becomes a continued part of your therapy. You know, I give up every, um, I'm sure a lot of your viewers will know the, uh, the show that was very popular, Entourage. And yes. the Entourage. So in that show, um, there's a character by the name of E, who's Kevin Connolly is his name. So Kevin and I grew up in the same town in Long Island, in New York, and he moved to LA when he was younger and, and obviously made a, a big name for himself. But every year we spend Christmas together and we do a big soup kitchen benefit uh, in our hometown in Patchogue, which is in Suffolk County in Long Island. And, you know, every year I look forward to it. I bust my ass, I get up early, I go there, I serve people all day long. We do it very special. We take all of the the neighborhood people who are less fortunate and it's not a matter of just giving them food we actually put together a whole menu and then we put like a shop outside with santa and we get a lot of donations with clothes and toys and and we just let the kids run amok and, and get free toys and clothes for the for the parents and then we stuff their faces and we stuff their pockets full of food when they leave and i look forward to it every year it's the best christmas present i could ever give myself that's awesome. That's it's wonderful. Really, it really is. It's an amazing day. I look forward to it every year. And, uh, you know, and sometimes my own family's like, well, what, what time are you coming over for dinner? And I'm like, I'm working. I, I'm working. <laughs> Remember, you know, not, I do this all day. Out, like if you don't need, need to eat, eat, but I'll be there when I get there. And so what I, what I was saying is that giving back, there is no better feeling. And nope. for me, when I share my story, and I see somebody get clean and I see somebody actually start to do the work because I don't sugarcoat it. I'm not telling you it's easy. I'm not telling you, you know, the problem is you were looking for a magic pill to get high. How'd that work for you? There is no magic pill to get clean. You got to do the damn work. Right. And it's rough. And there's a, a period of time where your brain has to rewire its firing order so the neurons can can appropriately fire and release the right amount of chemicals, not the chemicals that you're feeding it. I, I another analogy I use often is um, people know, you know, like if you're driving a car, right? They know that they have an automatic transmission where you just put the car and drive and go, or you have a stick shift where you have to manually put into gear. And I say, your body just wants to be that automatic transmission. The minute you start putting drugs into it, you just now turned it into a manual transmission. Now you're responsible for your happiness chemicals. And at first it's cool. Hey man, I'm doing this. I'm getting high. I'm having fun. But then it becomes a job. And then it's the waiting for the drugs and the paying for the drugs and the waiting and the waiting and the waiting. And then the dealers, they're screwing you because they know that you're not going to wait another hour for somebody. So they're going to give you less than what your money is really worth. And it's a whole game. And you don't realize when you're in the thick of it of how much bullshit is attached to it. Right. But when you get clean and you rid yourself of that, you go, wow, I can't believe how much time I was wasting. And that becomes the most important thing that I, that I share 
because I say that when one person shares, two people remember. I'm not teaching anybody anything. I'm helping you to remember. And by helping you to remember, I validate my own, my own theories, my own philosophies. And I hear the soundboard. I hear it coming back to me. Go, yeah, it still makes sense. Or, you know what? That doesn't really make sense anymore. I have to modify that viewpoint. So, I, what was I just saying? Um, still lose my train of thought. That's okay. I'm sorry, um, but I was going to ask you a question. Do you are do. you married? Do you have kids? No, I don't, and no, I don't. Okay, just curious. <laughs> that was easy. I just lost my my best friend of. 12 years, who was my Rottweiler. Uh, uh, she was with me when I got clean. She was with me when my best friend Steven died. Uh, she was with me through uh, relationships that ended and was my daughter. And I had to put her down about three months ago. And I thought that the day my dad died was the worst day. I thought that all my friend dying was that was the worst day to this point. The only saving grace was that nowadays that you have the option of having the vet come to your house and euthanize him in your own home. Hmm. And so I got to actually spend, I didn't let anybody near me or her for the last day. I spent the last day of her life with just me and her. I laid in her bed with her for about I don't know, 12 hours or more, cried my eyes out um, as if there were no more tears left. And I gave her the best life that, that I possibly could have, and she was my best friend, and I, I miss her every day. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. We had to put down our schnauzer recently, and I it's like, well, you don't put down a child, but it's like losing a child. It really is. You know, I, I used to say it's like having an autistic child because they still have needs. They need to be taken care of, but they can't communicate what it is that they need, and you have to be the one to really make a decision, and, you know, it was a very – it would have been selfish to keep her alive longer than she was supposed to be here. And it was very, very difficult. And, you know, it's part of life. I get it. Uh, and I will own another dog eventually. Um, I wasn't a child person. I don't, I, I don't, um, it, it's interesting. I, I connect with children. I speak to them very, um, I treat them like, I treat them like people. I don't treat anybody. I've met, my thing is, is I've met 12 and 13 year old people who have a clearer life perspective than some 50 year old people that I run into. This is so true. with that, I treat everybody as, as one, you know, and, and people like to be treated like that. They don't want to be spoken down to. And, and that doesn't matter, you know, your, your sex, your religion, your color, your race. It, it's we're all one. Just stop the nonsense already. Yep. <laughs> Steve, do you do, do you still do stunt work? You did a lot of stunt work, didn't I you? I did. And I do. Oh, cool. But just not right now because we're pandemicking. No, no, so no, no, nobody, nobody's open. Nobody's doing anything. And is it all in New York when you do it? Or do you go to LA? Um, I have done outside of New York, but mostly New York, yes. Okay. As a, and it's a big hub here. There's a 50-something shows that film here. So there is work. <laughs> awesome. So what are you doing right now during the pandemic? So I am doing some outdoor construction work with okay. social distancing, obviously. And uh, I run an eBay store. <laughs> okay. So as weird as that may sound, I have a, I have a, if you, I'm wearing this hat actually that says I got this. Uh -huh. And so this is a trademark that I have with the I got it collection, I-G-O-D-I-T collection. And um, it, it's not religious. It's just, a, a, I say, show the world that your confidence comes through faith. And that faith is just in, in energy and in, in positivity. And, you know, it all stems with, yeah, right. well, it, it all stems with us, but sometimes we want to put the blame and we want to put the, the praise on something else because we don't feel that we deserve it. So in the beginning, put the praise on whatever you have to. I tell people, get clean for, get clean for your wife. Get clean for your husband. It doesn't matter. It's all bullshit anyway. Get clean for whatever you have to. Just get clean. Right. And then once you start to get clean and you start to do the work, then you'll realize that you're doing it for yourself. But in the beginning, just do it for whoever you need to do it for, whatever reason. You want to you wanna say God. You want to say Buddha. You want to say your wife, your mom, your dog, Jehovah, whoever it is. It doesn't matter to me. Yeah. You know, I just want to see more people get clean. I think it's awesome. Steve, if someone wants to find you, how do they do that? So 
I am Steve Mason.com. It's probably the easiest way. Okay. Uh, or I got it collection.com or tough topics.org. That's my, um, I yeah, these you, you are racing for a pen. Yeah. Tough topics.org is my, um, my website that I do all of the speaking for these, um, for the schools and for the law enforcement agencies. So that's how they could book you as a speaker. Yeah. Tough topics.org. Perfect. And I am Steve Mason.com, which is. Yeah, that's pretty much all my stuff. My, the movie, my, I do a lot of, uh, uh, fight announcing cage announcing for like the MMA enthusiasts. Um, I do, I, I have a lot of things going on. <laughs> you, do, you do. Well, very, very well done being clean and sober as long as you have. And I can't thank you enough for sharing your story on That's the podcast. You, so much of what you say, we, we never, you know, argue or openly disagree with the people on our podcast, but so much of what you say goes exactly along the lines of what we believe and that is that you don't substitute one drug for another um the fact that you were able to get clean and sober the way you did is amazing uh, obviously a lot of people need help and they need treatment um i just hope that they will do it without drugs exactly and and i i mean this with from the the very bottom of my heart that anybody that reaches out to me um although i have a very busy schedule i have a, a a beautiful woman who's at my side, who's not only my girlfriend and my partner, but she's also my executive director of everything I do. And she makes me a better person every day. And, and I'm very grateful for her and appreciative for her. And we always say like, I will get, she will make sure that I get to everybody's question and answer anybody who has a question, anybody who has anything to say, I, I, Again, I'm like you, I don't argue with anybody. I don't openly disagree. Everybody's got to write their opinion. Um, but if anybody wants the real deal and wants to talk to me about it, I, that's, this is what I do. This is part of the reason I'm on this planet right now. That's mm -hmm. the bottom line. Yeah. And if they go to your website, there's a way to contact you. There's a yeah, there's okay. definitely contact pages. Okay. There. Okay. Steve, thank you. Thank, thank you for taking you. the time with us. I, my pleasure. I appreciate it. Thank you for listening to the podcast today. I thought that Steve's story was very inspiring. I mean, unless you listener lost a parent and saw them commit suicide when you were eight years old, you know, your story might not be that bad. Um, and for him to be at the place where he is today and be aware enough to not you know, substitute other drugs when he went to the hospital. I just think that um, this guy has a great story to tell and he um, has some really good truths that he can share with others. So once again, his uh, website for speaking is toughtopics.org. And then if you just want to know more about Steve, it's IamSteveMason.com. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts and please subscribe to our YouTube channel. When you subscribe and give us a good rating, it helps us get found by more people. And all we want to do is put out a message that there's hope and that there's help available. And so the more people we can reach, the better. We'll talk to you again next week. You have been listening to the Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return, sponsored by Narcanon Ojai. For more information on Narcanon Ojai, call 866-231-5924 or visit www.narcanonojai.org. Narcanon is a non-12-step rehabilitation program based on the works of L. Ron Hubbard.